Yeah. <laughs> yes, it's working, right? That's great. I don't know. <clears throat> so we can stop in one minute and uh, let's stop at, at noon or the yeah, so know. if you need more time. Okay. So, good morning. Um, I'd like to give this lecture now on, on moving mesh techniques, um, having talked about particle-based hydrodynamics and Eulerian-based hydrodynamics. Um, now we, we consider sort of something that's in between. And to motivate this, I want to quickly raise the issue of uh, accuracy in cosmological simulations of galaxy formation and evolution. And um, starting out with this old historic, by now sort of historic, code comparison of the Santa Barbara cluster. Com um, that was a code comparison project started at the end of the 90s, so sort of 15 years ago. And at the time, <coughs> people were doing sort of the first hydrodynamical simulations in cosmology, looking here at galaxy clusters. And um, these 12 codes that um, were compared were given, or the authors of these codes were given the same initial conditions. Uh, actually, they didn't use exactly the same initial conditions. They all of them reduced the, the resolution uh, of an um, initial displacement field that was given to them at high resolution to some, something that they could accommodate on their computers. This is also so possibly a source of a difference. Anyhow, these are the X-ray image, images of the clusters at the end. And you see that um, the results are not identical in all the cases. They all make uh, a reasonable cluster of uh, roughly uh, the same mass, but the details of the X-ray emission are not identical. So there is a certain systematic inaccuracy um, present in these codes, or you can call this a systematic uncertainty in the hydrodynamical simulations. And at the time, it was already clear that there was a systematic difference between SPH-based codes and mesh-based codes, Eulerian hydrodynamical codes. In particular, this was seen at the central entropy that was predicted in these clusters. That was higher in the mesh-based codes. There was a little core there, and it was con uh, falling in the SPH codes. And this is particular uh, troubling because sort of if you try to do convergence tests here in SPH, you find that sort of you, you get a pretty robust result, both sort of with SPH and both with the Eulerian codes, but these uh, seemingly converged results differ systematically at the center. 
So you then have to question what is actually correct, right? And you have a, a difference that doesn't disappear just simply by going to high resolution. So that is a worrying aspect of that. And then uh, <coughs> a few years ago, five years ago, sort of, uh, a little bit more, Oscar Agertz wrote this paper here um, comparing in a some number of uh, ice, uh, idealized toy setups, again, SBH codes with mesh-based codes. The setup, in particular in this um, test, is a, a supersonic wind blowing over a bubble uh, that's over dense and initially sits at pressure equilibrium at a hotter, in a hotter tenuous atmosphere. So this is kind of a, a model for uh, the interaction of a, a clump, say, falling into a, a thinner, thinner gas at relatively large speed. And then what you develop is a bow shock in front of this clump, and this will decelerate the, uh, the wind that's hitting this clump, and then the, hind the wind will stream um, over this a spherical clump on the sides. You, so you then have a strong shear flow uh, at the interface, and we have learned that there we expect kelvin helmholtz instabilities. Indeed, they should develop there and start to shred this clump after a while. This shredding is also clearly seen. This is a time evolution here in the columns. Here uh, in the third column, for example, this is at 1.27 Kelvin Helmholtz times. And you see that these three mesh codes here, Enzo, Flash, and Art, they develop uh, you know, a lot of uh, instabilities. And the clump is noticeably uh, shredded to a large degree already. And after a while, it actually goes away essentially completely. It's dispersed. While in the SPH code, we have a clump left. Basically, this is, and eventually it's accelerated and then will swim with the wind, and then the, the threading is also over. So there is, a, 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 again, a, a qualitative difference in the outcome. You have a residual lump here, you don't have it over here. Now, um, the question is you know, where this comes from, and we'll discuss some of the reasons for this. Let me first uh, remind you a bit about. Uh, the, the uh, conceptual differences in these two techniques. Eulerian codes and uh, Lagrangian codes, they, um, they <coughs> employ different um, discretization strategies. Here we discretize the volume on uh, a mesh of some kind. Here we discretize the mass and we get these particles. Then um, in, in the results that are obtained with these codes, we, we have rather sharp shocks in the Eulerian case somewhat less sharp contact discontinuities because, as we've seen, and also in the hands-on session, they can be washed out if they move uh, through space. They are diffused. There is a diffusion, numerical diffusion error that affects also moving contact discontinuities. So they are, can actually be less sharp sometimes than in the SPH code. And the post-shock properties are correct in the SPH code. So the shocks <coughs> aren't really a serious problem. They are just perhaps somewhat sharp in the Eulerian code. Then the mixing, we looked at this. This is uh, more interesting here. <coughs> mixing happens sort of implicitly at the cell level. It's also not described explicitly, but you automatically have this because you're adding together the different fluxes that are moving into a cell. And then you have basically a big blender in the averaging step that mixes these uh, new together. While in the Lagrangian code uh, here, in the particle-based SPH, mixing is entirely suppressed at uh, basically by construction because you give these quantities to the particles and then they stay associated with every particle and they don't jump from one to particle to the next unless you try to model this somehow explicitly. So, and that also means there is no entropy production through mixing um, unless modeled somehow. While here you can have also spurious entropy production by overmixing possibly, which is another way of saying that there's a lot of advection error. Then we, say, we saw that artificial viscosity is something that you have to add in SPH to capture the shocks. You don't need this in the Godunov schemes, which is quite nice. You, you have one free parameter less. And in fact, you kind of then know this is sort of the least numerical, vis you, you have some numerical viscosity, which is equivalent to the numerical diffusivity in a sense, but that's the least amount that you can use. And you don't have to add on top of that something artificial. In SPH, you have to do this, and it will sometimes hurt you be by being then um, too strong, causing viscous dissipation where it shouldn't happen. 
Then the issue of Galilean invariance, I will discuss this later a little bit more. That refers to the question, if you actually set whatever system you simulate, give it some constant velocity, that is a Galilean boost, the physics does not change by that, does your numerical result change? And one can say a, a scheme is manifestly Galilean invariant if, uh, at, uh, if such, a, such a Galilean boost does not change any of the numbers at all modulo a numerical round of error, right, which you always have to define a position, but if you eliminated that, it would really be identical. For SPH, that's the case. We'll see this is for Eulerian codes, it's not the case. Um, and then self-gravity can be treated nicely in SPH, and it's automatically strictly conservative doing that. This is also harder in Eulerian codes. Normally, you're actually not conserving total energy exactly anymore, manifest anymore, and you're doing this. There's one scheme now recently proposed that does that. That has, however, also uh, difficult. So normally, Eulerian codes will not exactly, that means at the manifest level in the change position, be able to preserve total energy, total energy if you have self-gravity. That's, that's the principle, the principle can, be can be a serious disadvantage, especially, especially at low resolution. Low resolution. But, but one can also, one can also show the arrow, arrow will go away if you use higher resolution. resolution. So, that, so that sense, that sense is benign. It's, it's not, it's not something that is not curable. curable. If you have, if you have well well resistance, resistance, the arrow will be small enough, enough that you can live with it. What I now what want I now to discuss, discuss is sort of something in between. between. Uh, uh, moving mesh code. Mesh code. And, and here, here the idea here is, uh, is uh, why not let this Cartesian mesh um, move along with the flow? And I show you this here in the example of a Kelvin Helmholtz instability, which doesn't work for some reason. Oh no. Okay. So here you see uh, a red fluid moving to the right, and a blue fluid is moving to the left. But the new thing here is that, that the mesh now, which was a Cartesian mesh in the beginning, is moved along with the fluid. <coughs> and <coughs> how this is done and why this has advantages, I will discuss now extensively. But here you see the general concept um, behind that. <coughs> right? So this is at, at sort of lowish resolution just to, see, uh, just to show the general idea. Now right away, if you do this, when you move um, the mesh so just along with the fluid, you can eliminate with this, as I'll, I'll show you more in, uh, later on, one of the um, issues with the Eulerian codes, this is referring to this Eulerian, uh, to this Galilean invariance, namely, um, as we also see, saw in your hands-on session, if you repeat this kelvin helmholtz test and you add a constant velocity everywhere, then the result will not change with periodic boundary conditions, right? Because the thing just comes in on the other side. And in principle, in a manifestly, cons uh, manifestly invariant scheme, you would then expect the results not to change. But we have seen also in our advection problem that if you advect more far, uh, faster, the numerical diffusion error will increase. And that's basically true for all the Eulerian codes because they prefer a fixed reference frame. And if your gas decides to move with a high velocity relative to it, then the accuracy with which this flow is followed is reduced. And for example, you can, if you make this such a boost, which is applied in these examples, these are three uh, repetitions of this kelvin helmholtz test mm -hmm. with a Eulerian fixed mesh code. If you make this velocity very large, you can, you can make the result arbitrarily bad also. Right? So that is... Um, just uh, a fact of life, even though I have with my colleagues a fierce fight about whether this effect actually is to be called Galilean invariance or not. But I would call it like this. <coughs> um, but that this effect exists, that everybody agrees. Right? So whether you want to call it Galilean non-invariance or something else is a matter of taste, ultimately. Um, but I think this effect exists. <coughs> So what is actually one way to maybe see this, why this must exist, such an effect in the Eulerian code, is maybe very simply uh, shown like here, if you want to follow me through this discussion. So we've seen that the how, how the Riemann solver is used in the Eulerian code. Right? We use it to determine the flux entering a, um, a cell on some interface. You have some interface, you, you consider the initial value problem for left and right state. 
This initial value problem you can solve exactly with a Riemann solver. If you want, you can use an exact Riemann solver to determine the wave structure that's created by this, which is, for example, in such a sort of tube problem, visible. And the wave structure will be consisting of a contact wave and two either shock or refraction waves. And these waves will be moving with some speeds to the right or left. And then what you're interested in is basically with speed zero, because your interface has speed zero, what is the state of the fluid along this line? This is where you sample it, and this state is invariant in time. And you read off the state, some density, some velocity of the fluid, some pressure. And this is the state that you uh, use to calculate the flux. Right? <coughs> so that is um, the Godunov method. Now let's look at this again. But consider now that you boost the whole problem and you let, say, all of the gas, everything, both on the left and right side, move with some velocity. Uh, to the left, say, with velocity v to the left. Now, if previously your mass flux was given by rho f times vf, what you would now expect is if you go to a boosted frame, the mass flux would, should be rho f times the velocity vf plus the velocity v that you boosted, okay? That's just the, how the uh, <coughs> how the velocity transforms and the mass flux is just rho times density. So the state of the fluid doesn't change because the physics hasn't changed. The state of the fluid there uh, is still the density rho f, but now it's the velocity is higher by this. But if you numerically have to solve this in your, your layering code, where everything is now moving to the left with some velocity v, um, uh, so to the right, sorry, with some, some velocity v, then um, all the waves are sort of oriented differently, maybe to the right, still the same Riemann problem, but your sampling will now occur at this place. And there you read off from the Riemann problem a new density rho f star, a new density uh, or a new velocity v f star. And then you can calculate the mass flux from this and you will find that in the general case, these two mass fluxes will not be equal. And that means manifestly, the, the, the change in the mass of the cell can't be the same because of this choice of reference frame, right? Even so, the physics, of course, invariant, but the discretization will nevertheless make it, uh, in this case, um, not manifestly invariant at, at this level of each individual cell. So now what I want to ask is how well does this moving mesh uh, approach work? And I, I want to show you first here a, a differentially rotating mesh that illustrates basically one point why if you use uh, this type of moving mesh, why the mesh is not destroying itself if there's shearing motion. Because if you look at these moving, uh, di you know, differentially moving disk and follow, for example, different cells by eye, you wonder why is it actually not the case that these, shells, these, uh, these cells are, are shredded and then destroyed um, on a short time scale because that is the traditional disease of moving mesh <coughs> techniques, that after a while you cannot um, prevent that the, the mesh is, self is destroying itself because there's too strong shear that creates high aspect ratios of cells or bow tie cells where they are sort of twisted to the extent that your mesh breaks down. That's avoided in this particular mesh, uh, ultimately because it's a so-called Voronoi mesh. And the Voronoi uh, diagram or the Voronoi mesh is uh, created by a set of points. Some of them were marked here. And um, the, cell, the cell simply consists of the region of space that's closest to the particular mesh generating point, closer to any other point. Now, if two cells are sheared um, apart, then the interface between them shrinks to zero. And at that point, you create a new cell interface to another point that again continuously grows from uh, zero size to finite length. And so you have a continuous change in the mesh geometry that is um, exactly the property that you need to avoid any discontinuous jumps in say volumes of cells or something like this. And that's a property that this Voronoi construction has which I will get to later. And you know once you have such a moving mesh you can for example adjust the mesh to uh, the geometry of the flow. Here is a, a simple example of a point explosion. 
a set of, set of Taylor blast wave, where in one cell a lot of energy was injected. And again, this is done here at low resolution to show you um, the geometry of the mesh, how it's changing with time. You see that the blast wave has hit the walls here, where it's uh, actually the boundary condition here is uh, uh, periodic or reflective. Uh, actually, doesn't matter much here. Could be that it doesn't matter at all. Here you are then compressing a lot of the mass into the corners, and then there's a little backsplash, right? And you see then that at low density regions, the mesh cells will get large, and at high density regions in the corners, they will get um, rather small. Here is a, a higher resolution Kelvin Helmholtz test that shows another uh, example of why such a moving mesh approach is, is interesting. Because in this uh, randomly seeded instability here, see this finely layered stuff is transported through space, advected, but the advection itself causes zero uh, numerical diffusion because the mesh moves along with the flow. And on a traditional Eulerian code, you would start to wash out all of the finer features because of numerical diffusion that comes from advection. This error is now avoided in the moving mesh. <coughs> um, yeah, and this is another fun thing. You see this banana here. You can also do um, interesting boundary conditions curved one, for example, so suppose you, have, you want to have a little um, solid object, for example, that's created here by in this Voronoi mesh with a set of points, two strings of points, blue and red. And now I tell the code, please treat the interface between the blue and the red point as a fixed wall so that uh, there is a reflective boundary condition there, so it's basically which means that um, that's like a solid a surface of an object. And then I can move this whole object as a solid body through um, maybe a, a fluid composed of two phases initially. And um, then you see what happens. Here is this um, kind of spoon moved through these two phases. And you'll see that this motion creates now interesting mixing uh, and turbulence in, in this uh, two-dimensional distribution. You know, we get these storm systems developing here, and little eddies. Um, and you see uh, lots of examples of Kelvin Helmholtz instabilities here, you know, all over the place. They are popping up, right? And um, <coughs> so that is um, something that in astrophysics, we don't really have solid boundary conditions like this, and coffee cups that have to be mixed. but. Uh, <laughs> Still, I think it's, it's you show, you, you s this shows um, sort of the interesting potential such a technique has. And again, you see the, the relatively fine fluid structures that are preserved here because of the low level of, of mixing. And so that also allows in principle to maybe for a given number of resolution elements to slightly increase the Reynolds numbers that you can represent in, in, things, uh, in turbulent systems. So if you wait long enough, this will be completely grayed out. Now, if you try this with SPH, you will see uh, that this is going to be hard, right? Because that's, the, uh, that's an example of subsonic turbulence where SPH is particularly um, inaccurate, basically, right? So this sort of level of detail, this is with 700 square points in 2D. You can try to do this with a particle-based method and you will probably not get such a nice result by long shot, in fact. Good, so um, more about uh, the technique. So this moving mesh is a Voronoi mesh. Voronoi tessellation is a very basic um, construction in computational geometry. Uh, in fact, it's probably the most basic one you can do for a set of points. So as you associate for these red points here, which I call the mesh generating points, you associate with them the region of space that's closest to them, closer than to any other point. And that means that the interfaces between two of these cells are um, the bisectors of the connecting lines of two points, and they're also orthogonal to these connecting lines. And it's basic geometry. 
And then it's interesting that actually the dual, there is a dual to this Voronoi mesh, so-called uh, Delaunay triangulation, that now connects these points in a triangulation. And um, this, the interesting mathematical property is that among all the possible triangulations here in 2D that you can do for these, two point, for these point sets, this is the one triangulation that fulfills the so-called empty circumcircle property that makes the Delaunay di triangulation also unique. Empty circumcircle means that if you put a circumcircle around, uh, or the cir yeah, around any triangle, it doesn't contain any other point. And it turns out this uniquely specifies a certain triangulation. And then this triangulation is the topological dual to this Voronoi mesh. That means that to every face here, you have a, uh, a Delaunay edge and vice versa. And then algorithmically, what this means is that you can actually construct the Delaunay triangulation and that is equivalent to having this thing over there because for every edge here, you know that there is a face over there. <coughs> and for constructing this, there are fast algorithms to do that, much easier than doing this directly. That's also why we do this in the Aripo code like that. Now, coming to the hydrodynamics on such a mesh, what do we have to do here? What's the difference to a Eulerian code? Well, first of all, it looks like there's almost no difference. You, you take the, uh, the Euler equations in the conservative form. <coughs> we have looked at this yesterday. And then you make a finite volume discretization, meaning that you integrate over every cell uh, the state of the fluid. That means you, what you will keep track of are the mass, momentum, and energy in a cell. And all you want to do is to, to keep track of changes of these quantities, which are simply given by the fluxes through the surface of the cell. The only new term that's appearing here is, um, is this one. This was absent yesterday, this state of the fluid times the velocity. What velocity W is that? <coughs> Actually, this is the velocity with which the, the face of a cell moves. So if you have a non-stationary mesh, a moving mesh, suddenly you have a flux term that is coming from the motion of the cell itself. And that is not there in a Eulerian code. And that's the new thing. And for a Voronoi mesh, it turns out you can um, get a very um, good control about this velocity of the phase because if you look at this Voronoi geometry of cells, if you have these mesh generating points, so they, the set of mesh generating points determines the geometry of the cells, but more, more than that, if you give the velocit velocities to these mesh turning points, these velocities will also determine uniquely uh, the velocity of all the faces of the cells. So you can use that directly in the flux calculation in the usual way. Now the flux calculation, however, um, yeah, and also more. I mean, there are many mathematical theorems known for the Voronoi mesh. You cannot only calculate the velocity of such a phase, you can also, for example, calculate how does the volume change of a cell as a function of all the velocities of the cells and their positions. And there are relatively simple geometric expressions that give you that. Right? So this is why this particular uh, mesh is, is very interesting for these mathematical reasons. You also, and that's another important thing, we discussed the need for gradient estimation. This you can do in the Voronoi case with something in the unstructured case using a uh, Green-Gauss gradient estimation technique that basically says that the, the surface integral of a scalar uh, um, dotted into the surface normal is equal to the volume integral of the, the gradient of the scalar. And this you can use to estimate the gradient of the scalar in a cell by basically estimating the surface integral. And that leads to a, a gradient estimation formula for the Voronoi mesh and turns out this gradient is always second order accurate, independent of how the points are oriented. And that's a unique property of the Voronoi tessellation, which is very important because it means even though the mesh is, has a weird geometry, your gradient estimate is always second order accurate. That's also a big difference to SPH where the gradient estimate has a large error, okay? Especially it's, it's not second order accurate for arbitrary point configurations. That causes some of the problems in SPH, and that's then absent in this unstructured grid. Other than that, you, you do the same thing. You do a, a reconstruction like in the Eulerian code, and you do a slope limiting. You just have a different 
more complicated gradient estimation formula. And then you also want to do something that allows you to exploit this Galilean invariance. For this you have to be a little bit careful because you would like to actually pick for the evaluation of the Riemann problems. We saw that the problem with the Eulerian codes is that they have to adopt a certain reference frame for evaluating the Riemann problems. And that choice is um, a fixed one and has, is independent of whatever the fluid wants to do. Now what we want to do is we want to tie the choice of reference frame for calculating the Riemann problem to the fluid state itself. We want to go into the rest frame, the local rest frame of the fluid for that, which we can do and we actually have to choose the rest frame of the phase in which, um, uh, uh, yeah, in with which the phase moves. So we want to go into this frame. And <coughs> for this you have to transform the fluid state first before you do the Riemann problems into this frame. This means you subtract the velocity of the, the interface. The next thing is that you do what we learned in the in about the muscle scheme, that you use the, uh, the Jacobian um, and the gradient to predict a half-step prediction forward in time. And then you also have to rotate the states such that basically you have the x-axis or whatever orthogonal to the, to the interface. You apply a rotation matrix in 3D, you solve the Riemann problem, then you get the state of the fluid on the interface and you have to undo these transformations. You, return, you turn the, the state back, you go back into the lab frame, the inverse of the rotation matrix, and then you calculate the flux. Right? And then you update your conserved quantities with the fluxes, and then you can show that this scheme is indeed Galilean invariant. That means, you know, because um, that, you know, you can show that manifestly the results don't change. Modulo round of errors if you go now to a boosted frame. And that in particular reduces the uh, numerical diffusion for contact discontinuities. Here are a few examples that illustrate this. This is a uh, Woodward and Colella's double blast problem. This is a 1D strong uh, shock problem where strong shocks bounce back and forth in this box for a few, few times. Then you get for this density this uh, sort of uh, black line underneath. Here's a comparison for the same number of, of cells of using such a moving mesh relative to a static mesh. And you see that uh, both numerical re simulations reproduce this um, general trend relatively well. But for example, here's a strong contact discontinuity. This is washed out much more in the Eulerian code. So the result actually improves here in this case, in the moving mesh case. Comparison with SPH, this is uh, something calculated by Deborah Sh Shiachki. Here is in 2D a strong shock problem. And again with the same number of cells comparing now this SPH uh, code gadget with this moving mesh code a repo. And you see um, you know complicated dynamics here, many um, shocks bouncing off these boundaries etc. And here what's particularly interesting is that you develop some um, vorticity by the baroclinic term and there's a Richtmeier mesh curve instability here as well and this stuff is um, captured more accurately in the mesh code. In particular you see this little ed these little uh, curly eddies there that develop here, right, in this mushroom-like feature. They are simply not captured now in SPH because it's not accurate enough for this. <coughs> but on the other hand, I should also say for the defense of SPH, you know, if you look from this, you look at this from a distance, it's of course awfully similar, right? The shock waves move with the right speed and so on. So, you know, depends on what level of accuracy you, you ultimately need, basically. Here is another example um, that illustrates another concept where how you should really look at, I think, objectively at the accuracy of codes. This is a, a, a vortex flow. Um, basically, this uh, rotating vortex should be, uh, the analytic solution for this is stationary in time. This is just turning forever basically and if you do this in a numerical code uh, at some resolution the, the turning motion will die out with time because of numerical diffusivity again and viscosity. And you can then use that as a benchmark of 
how much numerical viscosity is there actually. And also you can use such, such a thing to benchmark whether um, you are converging to the analytic solution, which is in this case the initial conditions for this velocity profile, if you increase the resolution. And you know, this you can do. Here are, is a result that shows uh, an L1 error norm where you simply add up the difference between your numerical result and the analytic result. Um, for every cell, you take the, say, the norm, the, as for example, the absolute difference. Um, and this L1 error norm, you expect when you use more points per dimension, you expect this to go down with um, resolution. And that's what, for example, here the Reap on the Athena code show. It nicely goes down with a as a power law. And in fact, this moving mesh code reproduces the uh, uh, same slope of convergence as the Athena code. So the convergence rate here is the same, which is good. You know, I was relieved that basically with the moving mesh, you achieve the same convergence rate as you have with a fixed mesh code of second order accuracy. But if you're in Athena, if you add a boost, then you would actually get a higher error. This is the additional advection error that I just discussed from the non-Galilean invariance. It will still converge though, also in the boosted case, right? But you then have to have, you then have to use considerably more cells to get down to the same error as, as a repo. Question here is in this code is basically, which I'm always asked a lot, and uh, there was a long, um, isn't that awfully expensive to make this Voronoi mesh? Yes, it is at some level. Um, Compared to the, 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 the no-brainer of a Cartesian grid, it is pretty complicated, as you'll see. But uh, on the other hand, it turns out it's actually not a, a limiting factor for most calculations that are of interest. And first, what, what can you do to calculate this uh, Voronoi mesh? As I said, first of all, you want to calculate the Deloney mesh because that's much easier. And it is essentially equivalent um, to the Voronoi mesh. Mm -hmm. In 2D, there are a number of algorithms in the literature for doing this, like they come under names of divide and conquer, for example, that's considered to be the fastest possible in 2D. Sequential insertion, a sweep line algorithm, and, and a few others. Uh, 3D hull, hull projection, this works in any dimension. In 3D, there, is, uh, there are less. Sequential insertion stands out, and then again, the projection of a 4D convex hull to 3D. This works in any dimension, but it's a very slow one. Um, incremental construction is also really hard. So what I will show you now is what we realized in this repo code is sequential insertion that works like this, that you um, start out with some pre-existing triangulation, then you would add, want to add the points one by one. So this is done by first finding the triangle in which you want to insert the point, then you insert the point by splitting the triangle, and then you need to heal the mesh locally because normally you violate them the Deloney hood uh, uh, restriction. One thing that I, I should say that makes this hard is um, so-called um, general precision assumption. Because the Deloney mesh is uh, fully um, <coughs> determined basically by, in principle, by the empty circumcircle condition, but this is really only true in the so-called general precision case, where the points are sufficiently um, sort of irregularly distributed that a case like this does not never appear. A case like this is, say, four points in a square configuration so that you can actually, if you look at the Deloney mesh, you can make a triangulation out of this by running the diagonal from the top left to the bottom right or from the bottom left to the top right. Both of these configurations will give you a, a valid Deloney triangulation. But one then says this is a degenerate case. You then suddenly, the Deloney triangulation is not unique anymore the corresponding Voronoi grids are still unique, uh, the Loni not, and this uh, degeneracy is actually causing a lot of algorithmic headache, which I don't want to discuss in detail, but this is to try to write a, uh, uh, um, write a code that does such a triangulation, in especially in 3D, this is what's causing a lot of headache. So here's what we do. We need to find the point in, in, um, uh, in which triangle it falls, so this you can actually do by simply quickly walking through the triangulation. So this is something really quick. And also by pre-ordering the points, this operation is something that's very quick. Then, and it's also very local. Then, then you split the triangle like this, okay? Now you have a new triangulation. The trouble with this is that 
these new triangles that are marked in red, they are not necessarily Delaunay triangles. This one, and that's what you now have to check. You need to check whether the circumcircle <coughs> of this triangle does contain another point. In this particular case, it does not. So this is, then you know at this point, this is a correct triangle. It must be in the final tessellation. This triangle <coughs> does contain a point, actually several. This is bad, so you have to discard this triangle, and you need to discard this by flipping this edge that you um, have in this quadrilateral. So you flip this edge and you create two more triangles, which again you have to check. Check this triangle, this is good, we keep it. This triangle is good, this one is bad again. We flip, we get new two new triangles, those need to be checked. This one is okay, this one is okay as well, and then you're done. Okay. And believe it or not, we do this, this operation. Now you can do this uh, really quickly. And um, in 3D, however, which is the relevant case in practice, you have actually to replace two tetrahedra. So the triangulation are now tetrahedra. And the flips that I just showed you are replacements of two tetrahedra to three and uh, back. And when you have degeneracies, they're actually even nastier switch is possible, which I don't want to explain in detail. Two to six flips and what the heck. But um, we can process, I mean, we, we do these um, mesh constructions containing, say, 60 billion, tri 60 billion tetrahedra in something like 20 to 30 seconds on a parallel supercomputer. So you can do this really fast, right? The, uh, the splitting is, um, yeah, you need to deal with the degeneracy. For example, if you want to work, let this work also for um, the case of a Cartesian mesh. Initially, for example, if you start with your points in a Cartesian grid, you have degeneracies all over the place. And then you need to uh, consistently break them. And you, for example, you need to be able to decide, and I just want to flag this problem here, you need to decide pres uh, unambiguously, basically, whether a point, for example, this red one, is on the line in this diagram and these two triangles, whether it's on the line or whether it falls on the left side or the right side. How do you actually decide this? Well, it seems trivial enough, but you, you have to, uh, you, if you do the, the, the geometry calculations in, uh, that are, are needed for this, you realize um, after a while, ultimately this boils down to deciding the sign of a certain determinant. And this determinant uh, basically has then terms that are large and of opposite signs if you get close to the line. <coughs> and if you're exactly on the line, the determinant will be zero. And then the sign determines in which side you are. And basically, once you have a lot of uh, floating po point round of error, then you can get an error in the determination of the sign of this determinant. And that you have to avoid under all costs. And you have to basically detect this by monitoring the computational the round off error, and if it's getting too large, you then have to do, say, an exact estimate of, of with either, um, with either um, uh, you know, there are different possibilities, either arbitrary floating point math, or we use some exact integer arithmetic for this. So now in 3D, this actually works. I just want to entertain you with uh, two, some examples. This is uh, now a, a colliding disk. It's really a colli collision of a uh, couple of millions of tetrahedra, in a sense, because that is done with this. Uh, it's a little bit bright here. You don't <coughs> see that much, I'm, I'm afraid. Yeah. Maybe you can draw the curtain. Um, um, yeah, so this is um, actually here a, a galaxy merger, and then there's gas driven into the nucleus. Here's a black hole sitting here as well. And there will also be some agent activity. This is more, more demonstrator here that you can do um, just like you can do with SBH. Um, you, um, in, in fact, I've done previously the very same model also with SBH. And if you do this with the mesh code, you, you get, in fact, you get for a long time very similar results. But at the end, there are some interesting differences in the outflow in particular that develops. Um, then uh, we also have done magnetic fields on this mesh. One problem here is that uh, I've discussed here magnetic fields in detail. The Eulerian mesh codes, they are very precise. 
in, in their magnetic field treatment, they can use so-called constraint transport approaches. This is very uh, difficult on a, on a moving mesh, maybe even impossible to do that. So you have to resort to more, more classic methods to constrain um, diff B arrows uh, to a reasonably small size. But we think it's actually uh, giving us uh, rather decent uh, treatment of magnetic fields. One can also do physical vi viscosity. This is some work by Diego Munoz. Um, where he added a, a Navier-Stokes solver, a full-blown one, to this moving mesh. And you can study here, for example, for different Reynolds numbers, the flow over uh, this obstacle, you know, and see these characteristic features. And also study things like the Taylor vortex problem, which is a common test problem um, in turbulence uh, theory and also in experimental theory, where you have these two rotating cylinders creating um, these... Uh, transitions um, to turbulence as a function of Reynolds number. Question is, after all this effort to make a moving mesh code, does that um, really make, an, make a difference? Is it, uh, is it um, something that is worthwhile considering? And I think um, I would argue probably yes. It's, it is certainly uh, giving you um, higher accuracy probably, and it shows that this higher accuracy does make a difference in some, some Results and we recently ran uh, calculations of galaxy formation, uh, comparing particularly the SPH code gadget and a repo with the same very simple um, physics description for star formation and feedback, and in this case, uh, a feedback that is sort of weak, uh, that is only regulating the star formation in the ISM, but not uh, doing any uh, more violent things like driving strong outflows and so on. And this case, however. Um, which is basically a weak feedback case, but it's the s still the same feedback in SPH and, and the moving mesh. We find surprisingly strong, or I'm not sure whether surprising, but we find very, very important differences on small scales. On large scales, you look here at the gas density field um, <coughs> in this mesh code against the SPH code, it's very similar. Um, you will not spot a, a clearly a difference on these large scales. If you zoom in, in this white square um, on this halo, you see that uh, in the temperature <coughs> field, there is um, starting uh, to be a difference in the outer parts. There seems to be more, more heating going on in the SPH code. But overall, it's still at this level relatively similar. If you zoom in further, then, then you see larger differences. Here is the gaseous disk. The star forming disk in this galaxy in the moving mesh code, and this the same star forming disk in the SPH code. And, well, they're not equal, right? They, they show uh, similarities. Here's a satellite coming in, but around uh, this object, there is a much more lumpy gas distribution. Yes, please? Um, there is a difference here. This is um, this run was, I think, 30% more costly than the SPH run. Right. Should say, however, this is a. Uh, I'm always I'm always asked this question, and I, I, I I'm slightly annoyed by by it because <laughs> I think I, I do we because yeah, that's the first reaction. Oh, isn't it really costly? You know, I should I rather use a faster code, even if it's less accurate. You know, this is part of. I'm not. I'm, I'm not saying you won't would say that, right? But I mean, I have very often been confronted with the objection against this technique that is too slow to be taken seriously or so. But actually, it is not true, right? It's actually the overhead, the increase in cost, even if there's one compared to the, in this particular case, comparing the scheduled code and the repo. There was, due to the mesh construction, mostly a, a, a net increase in the computation cost by maybe 30%. I can tell you, however, now, because for the past two or three years, I personally and my, my, uh, uh, my colleagues have only worked on the Aripa code, making it faster and leaner. Now it's much faster than the gadget code. Okay. So then this mutes this argument, right, a lot. <coughs> mm. So, and these disks are... Um, different too. So you see uh, lots of these disks. They are, if you compare them to the SP, they are more better defined, but you also see from these pictures they're actually more massive, right? 
they are not only uh, more disky, okay, but they are also con clearly containing more cold gas, right? And this is actually also, um, this is not the sole reason why they are nicer, but this is contributing to it. And there is a big difference, um, yeah, consequently also in how the stellar morphologies of these galaxies look like. Um, but there is a difference in the late time star formation rate density predicted by these cores. And there you get, uh, get to the point. It's not just about pretty galaxies, it's about also that they make different amounts of stars. It's because the uh, cooling rates are actually different. So you see this here, this is a, in, as a, this plot, the, the star formation rate as a function of cosmic time. So the area under the curve is the cold amount of stars you form. And the blue run, blue run is the beige run, run here, and have, have a late time star formation. Less formation. Less. And it's, and it's actually because, because there is less cooling, cooling um, um, out of the out halos. Of the halos and is another way, another way that shows the star formation, star formation function, function of function galaxy size, 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 size in this case. And you see that a big thing means this moving mesh code makes more stars than it and causes more stars. And there is another numerical difference here. That is interesting. interesting. And also and the, also the sizes, sizes, this is something Paul Torrey did, um, analyze that the sizes are significantly larger in the repo of galaxies. Um, they are more consistent with the sizes you expect for this galaxy's observationally. So you can, uh, this is um, partially because of angular momentum losses that are less severe in the repo code, partially also because of more cooling. And, you know, uh, you could go on forever about um, these comparisons, and I should just show you a few more things. This is another movie that shows the, um, shows a bunch of clumps that were put into a toy atmosphere and to show that there are differences in how gas are stripped, and that affects, for example, how orbits of satellites decay, and how they vanish in, you know, how long they, they, um, they move around. And if you look at this, you'll see that these lumps, they more or less fall intact into the center. And yes, but yeah, there's hardly any stripping going on. This is kind of consistent with what we, and because of that, also the ramp pressure on them is different. That's why the orbital evolution is different. While those guys lose a lot of mass uh, earlier in this mesh code. That is similar to what we saw in this clump test of Argots, right? The lumps are not really destroyed much here in this SPH, and that affects a lot of things how, for example, the, this is heated from infalling lumps and how gas is delivered to galaxies. That is also very different uh, in these two approaches. And these lumps, you see these lumps, if you look at an uh, SPH calculation, also in the literature, this is something from our own work, from my student Markus Wadepool. The Aquila halo, you see here the, the gaseous halo in at two different resolutions in SPH of the Aquila comparison <coughs> project, basically. It's not the halo that was simulated. There was another, this is the halo A1 in, in the, the A halo in the, in the Aquarius project. Um, so another halo, but this doesn't matter really here. What you see is that in the gaseous atmosphere, there are these white spots. These are, these are lumps that are there. And eventually they typically will fall into the galaxy or they even make stars way out in the halo. And these um, Kaufmann blobs, or they used to be called after, uh, in famous meeting in Wengen, I think, or in Davos. They are present also in, in, in if you look at the, at the, for example, the, the area simulation. So it's not just the case that Gadget makes them, but at least the old, well, the traditional formulations of SPH are prone to this, okay? And now people come up with <coughs> suggestions that uh, avoid that, that feature. And in the moving mesh code, you have much smoother gas atmosphere. So the gas is there dispersed um, in these lumps and they are not, these instabilities um, do not exist or, um, that, that create them in the first place. Yeah, and okay, so I'm, I think I'm basically out of time, so I don't want to discuss turbulence. This is also uh, in why they are different there. Do I have anything else to say? Yeah, this is sort of alluding to uh, what I just discussed. We, we find that because of these uh, lumps in particular and the heating of the, uh, the halos by viscous, uh, spurious viscous heating in SPH that the so-called cold accretion that was claimed to be dominating the, uh, the way the galaxies get their gas is uh, the, uh, quantitatively the uh, significance for this much reduced for large galaxies in the moving mesh code. So that's another, uh, I think, 
uh, major result that has come out of this comparison that uh, some of the claims that it's all cold accretion have been overstatements in my opinion. There is also hot accretion on galaxies for large systems. So um, then I want to close with this. Thanks a lot. <coughs> Yeah. <laughs> Are there questions? Yeah, a few. Who was first? Here, I think. You were first, I think. I would like to ask, uh, um, how, how does this uh, closer compare to other AMR for, for instance, uh, Francis or uh, Renzo? Um, that's oh, a very... Sorry, Paul, can, can, can you maybe just repeat the question? I can, yeah. The, the question was, how does this Aripo moving mesh code compare with AMR codes like Ramsey's or, or Enzo? Uh, uh, very good question. I, I cannot really say much about this. This will be something very interesting to look into the future. Um, there are some hints, um, for example, in the Aquarius, uh, or sorry, Aquila comparison project, this was one halo uh, that was simulated um, with different codes, with a lot of physics. Um, Ramses was used for it, and also a repo. And there we saw this cooling difference that uh, the mesh codes cooled more gas, and but the cooling that we saw in a repo was exactly the same that was obtained with Ramses. So that was encouraging that they seem to agree very well there, okay, in the way how much cold gas is predicted, how much. Uh, how many stars are predicted. But I think in the, uh, it's definitely interesting to further compare these techniques, yeah, because then you learn about the deficiencies. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I, I, I would have to um, start using Ramses for that myself and check it out. But, um, and Enzo, but I think <coughs> what I hear about Enzo is that it's, uh, I would think that the, uh, the gravity solver or the scalability of, uh, of Enzo is rumored to not be stellar for zoom runs. So I would think that it's not faster, but I don't know for sure. about the photo isolation. Mm -hmm. Is there a way that you can systematically perturb your nodes to avoid degeneracies? Yes, there is. A, this is a, well, there are two approaches to this. One is, of course, the, naive, the naive one is just adding some random perturbation on all your points all the time. This is uh, um, not very, very elegant that you can try, and you're not guaranteed that it will work in all cases doing that, and also will mm -hmm. introduce inaccuracies. There is, however, also described in mathematical literature a technique um, called um, where, you, where you basically do a systematic um, a, a, a sort of a virtual perturbation of the points that you somehow keep track of all the time and break the degeneracies that way consistently. This is one option you could have. It's, however, complicated. I looked into this when I, when I encountered this problem and decided not to try this. But, but it's possible, yes. Mm -hmm. So, and you say you solve these problems with these degeneracy gases. Would it um, make any difference if you would start with a non Cartesian grid? And would it be advantageous in a way that the problem that you have to create all this initial stuff then on a non Cartesian grid, so that it would outweigh these problems? I don't know. Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, you could, um, you could um, just say I'm, I'm trying to avoid the occurrences of degeneracies all, all the time. So I'm just starting from a sufficiently non-degenerate mesh. Um, that's okay, you could do, do it like this. It's just that you then would have, um, you would restrict yourself quite a bit. So and um, I think, you know, the, the issue is what, what we do now, we, we detect that we only uh, need this higher um, accuracy in floating point math when it's really needed and um, 
then we detect that and then we use it and so it doesn't cause then after you've dealt with all these problems significant overhead. Except in the case when you really start with a Cartesian mesh, then you have degeneracies everywhere and then the mesh construction is actually slower than normal by quite a bit. But we used it only for these test runs like in the movie that you would like to see, oh, what happens if I actually start with a Cartesian mesh with time and you would like to have this option. Then we'll, what you will find is that the first the mesh construction, as long as the mesh is Cartesian, is quite slow. But as soon as, as it sort of becomes uh, more, um, I wouldn't call it random, but more irregular, more, more, more non-asymmetric in a sense, not so strictly symmetric, not so degenerate, then, it, then you see the full speed because you don't have degeneracy in anymore. <coughs> Well, the, um, the moving mesh is parallelized um, by domain decomposition. So we um, give every, every processor, at least in distributed memory, a certain, num a certain part of the, the points. Um, and then they have to construct their, their Voronoi mesh. And then you have to, however, import so-called ghost points or ghost cells, very similar to what a Cartesian grid does normally, to mesh the different mesh pieces together that are distributed. And in practice, this is indeed a very complicated bookkeeping procedure because unlike in a Cartesian mesh, where this is almost trivial compared to this unstructured mesh, we now have to uh, make basically two ghost layers on two uh, adjacent processes, which are, if you put them on top, need to overlap precisely. And you have to uh, make the association correctly from processor to processor so there's a lot of bookkeeping code involved. And that was, in developing this code, this is probably the hardest part. <coughs> okay, if there is no further question, we can thank for your <laughs> and, uh, Before leaving, I must uh, quickly do a, um, an announcement. So tomorrow evening, we will have the final hands-on session that will be given by um, Ralph, and he will uh, use the code uh, called the Red, Red MC, which is a relative transfer code. We've put this code on the web pages of the, the SASFI course. Uh, unfortunately, the, the version we put is outdated now, so uh, we have put a new one. So please go to the web page and download the version, which is uh, flag.35. And if you already installed the first one, it will be very easy to install the new one. Thank you.